Discerning call is a tricky thing. I can remember being in the ordination process and being asked to describe my call to committee after committee. It was always a weird thing to describe. And it was all too easy to fall into the trap that call was about ordained ministry. And you either had a call or you didn't. But that's a really, really narrow view of call. Call intimates that a conversation is unfolding. Specifically, a conversation between God and us. And that puts us in the land of the audacious. God speaking to us? How do you know it is the legit voice of God and not some other voice? How do you recognize that voice? What voices are we to heed and which are we to dismiss? And what are the consequences of taking that voice to heart? What are the cost? It gets complicated fast. And spoiler alert, nobody is off the hook. This isn't an ordained thing or an especially holy person thing or something that only comes to the other guy thing. This is something that comes to everybody in this room, whenever and however God chooses. And the more need there is in this world, the greater the chance that your number's going to be up. That's where 1 Samuel starts. The word of the Lord was rare in those days, we're told. Visions were not widespread. And frankly, the world then was a hot mess. As then, so now. Eli and his two sons served as priests at the sanctuary at Shiloh. And Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were absolutely abusing their office as priest. They were scoundrels, the text tells us, and had no regard for their priestly duties. They made a mockery of the sacrifices that people offered, stole the best parts for themselves, treated the offerings of the Lord with contempt, and they were laying with the women who served at the entrance of the tent of meeting. It wasn't a good look. Eli knew it wasn't a good look. He tried to talk with them and to get them to reform their ways, but to no avail. There was a young boy who was also ministering to the Lord. Samuel was his name. His mother, Hannah, couldn't conceive, and every year she and her husband, Elkanah, would go to offer a sacrifice at Shiloh. She made a deal that if she could just be blessed with a child, that she would offer the child for service. And so it was that Samuel was conceived and born and came to minister to the Lord under Eli's guidance. The text tells us that Eli's sight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see. How true this can be. Maybe it's old age that dims our sight and clouds our vision, but maybe it's other things too. What might dim our sight and cause us not to see things so clearly? For Eli's sons, it was the lure of the high life and power and excess and plain old greed. Those things cloud the sight of a good many people to this day. But other things condemn our vision too. The pace of life, the sheer magnitude of things that clamor for our attention, some total distractions, but some of great importance, or the weight of what we have always known. What causes you not to see things clearly? Then there's Samuel. Three times the Lord calls and three times he runs to Eli. 
What was it that made it so hard for Samuel to accept that the Lord was calling him? Did he not trust himself because of his youth? Did he de facto assume he didn't have enough experience? Ergo, it couldn't be God wanting to talk to him? And of course, Eli is a little slow on the uptake too because he's not perceiving the voice of God either. Three times he dismisses the boy and sends him back to bed. And that happens. When we're in Eli mode, we might be quick to dismiss that God is speaking a word through someone because, well, why would God use that person? That's Nathaniel's approach in today's gospel. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Dismiss the possibility out of hand because of some preconceived bias we hold. And from Samuel's side, when we first start to accept the possibility that voices do speak to us, and we start to share that with a trusted other, it can set us back a ways if the voice of authority says, nah, go back to bed. With the implicit and unspoken, it's all in your head. So hats off to Samuel for persevering with this mysterious voice and staying with this nascent call and for continuing it to bring it to the attention of the priest. Sometimes we've got to keep nagging to get others, including the church, to listen to the fact that God just might be trying to break through. Finally, Eli gets that this just might be the Lord here, and he sent Samuel back a fourth time with a very specific instruction. Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. It always starts with, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. It did for Samuel. And Mary had her own, let it be with me according to your word moment. Inviting God to speak, surrendering to this voice, and opening your heart to listen and receive what God is saying, well, it can turn your world upside down. And not just your world, but the whole world. A whole lot of transformative movements started with the willingness to hear what God had to say, to let it be conceived in one's being, and then to speak it into the world, sometimes with words, sometimes with action, sometimes by simply embodying it in your being. Because God doesn't want a word to fall to the ground. Just saying, it is no small thing to invite the Lord to speak. And we sure don't have control over what it is that God wants us to hear and convey. In Samuel's case, it was infinitely bad news that he had to deliver to his beloved mentor and boss. Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision that God was about to punish Eli's house forever. And to Eli's credit, he didn't bury his head in the sand. He told Samuel not to hide anything that God had said from him. He wanted to know the truth. Hard stuff. Hard for Eli and hard for Samuel. Call is that hard sometimes. We don't always hear what we want to hear from God. Sometimes it's a no when we long to hear a yes. Sometimes it's a yes when we just as soon hear a no. Sometimes it's a wait when we are ready to take action. And sometimes it's a get up and move with some courage when we'd be pretty content to stay the course and not rock the boat. God can have all kinds of words for us, all kinds of calls, and some of them are going to be daggone uncomfortable. Our job is to keep trying to pick out the voice of the Lord 
amidst the myriad of voices that are trying to grab our attention. And to keep going back to the place where we first heard a trace of that call. And to invite God to speak with the servant's willingness to heed what God then says. Not for the faint of heart. And just as with Samuel, no prior experience required for this gig. Only the willingness to listen. There's one other aspect of call that shows up in the gospel passage today that is so beautiful. And it has to do with finding and inviting. The day before the encounter we hear about this morning, John and two of his disciples were hanging out. Jesus walks by and John exclaims, look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples hear this and follow Jesus. Jesus turns around and asks them, what are you looking for? They ask him where he's staying, and he says, come and see. One of the disciples, Andrew, goes and finds his brother Simon and tells him that they found the Messiah, and then brings Simon to Jesus. The following day, it's Jesus' turn to do the finding. He decides to go to Galilee, but first he finds Philip and says to him, follow me. Philip found Nathanael and explains that they've just found him about whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. And after the little dismissive, can anything good come of Nazareth detour, Philip said to him, come and see. And in the coming and seeing, an encounter opens up where Jesus can help Nathanael understand that Nathanael was found long before Philip called him to come. There's this dance of following and finding and being found and coming and seeing. In other words, part of obedience to call comes in the following before it makes any rational sense. And sometimes obedience is about finding others and inviting them to come and see. And other times, obedience is about allowing yourself to be found and trusting the voice of the one who is inviting you to come and see. In all these cases, it's never about beating somebody over the head and forcing them to see what we see. But it's always about honoring their process. The come and see opens up a space where Jesus can encounter them on the terms most needed by them. It rarely unfolds in the way we envision and never on our timetable. At its heart, call is much more intuitive than it is logical. It is much more the way of wisdom than following dictates or formulas. It is much more mystical than prescribed. It is more invitational than coercive. And it is most often worked out in community in relationship with others who are also feeling their way forward. So where is the voice of God calling to you? Are you open, receptive, and listening? Or are you letting others get into your headspace telling you that's crazy talk and going back into a sleep state? And once the words land and you take them in, are you speaking them back into the world as God desires? Or are you softening them to make them easier to swallow? If someone is coming to you to sift through what they've heard God say, are you taking them seriously? Or are you responding with skepticism? And if they've got a word for you that you really don't want to hear, do you welcome that word? Or do you find a way to avoid the truth that might be coming your way? As you encounter Jesus... Who are you needing to find and invite to come and see? 
and who is reaching out to you, sensing that you might be a bit lost and in need of being found. And one level deeper, what part within you might need to be found and invited out of the shadows to come and see? What shifts in us when we move from demanding to inviting? And how does our following shift if we understand that in Jesus, he invites much more than he demands? Call is everywhere. Jump in wherever these questions spark something in you. God has been in conversation with this world since the beginning, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit show no signs of letting up. Find and be found. Come and see. Listen and receive. Then speak into this world with every aspect of your lives the word that God so longs to say. Today, God is calling you, whether you feel timid or bold and brave, with the humility of Samuel, answer, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening.